Montez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all uh, as, as our panelists here for lending your expertise and your insight uh, to help us better legislate, and especially thank you to Dr. Georges for, as a professor at Lehman College, for representing the Bronx so well here in this body. Um, I, I have a question. I wanted to continue a little bit on, um, on my colleague um, from California's line of questioning about public investment in research and development. Um, you know, I guess you would say that, that this is, it, it, would it be correct, uh, Dr. Kesselheim, to characterize the NIH money that is being used in, in development and research as an early investment? Yes. So the public is acting as an early investor in the production of these, um, in the production of these drugs. Is the public receiving any sort of direct return on that investment from the highly profitable drugs that are developed from that, from that research? Uh, no, in most cases, uh, there isn't, when, those, when those products are eventually handed off to a for-profit company, there aren't uh, licensing deals that bring money back into the coffers of the NIH. That usually doesn't happen. So the public is acting as early investor, putting tons of money in the development of drugs that then become privatized, and then they receive no return on, on the investment that they have uh, made. Right. Um, Dr., uh, Dr. Anderson, I have a question. Since you study comparative insurance systems, are there models where the public where the public does receive returns on investments in other insurance uh, in other insurance models across the world, there are a few, but they're relatively uncommon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and how does that tend to work? So essentially, if if the uh, places that the UK or some places like that have invested money in it, they will get some rate of return on those investments. Mm -hmm. But that, again, it's relatively uncommon. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also have one question for uh, Dr. Georges, and please, um, please stop me if, my, if I'm going out of the scope of your expertise. Um, as, a, as a nurse, in your, in your experience as a nurse, do you have uh, knowledge of the VA, like in general knowledge of the VA and how the VA works? Yes, some knowledge. And uh, in your experience, is the VA as a, um, as a public-owned and operated an operation, rather, are the drug prices in the VA lower or higher or the same? Well, that I as what we see in general, I don't have that that kind. So, of they, they they tend to be much lower so than, they, than in other places in the. So, so they tend about thirty one percent lower than what Medicare pays. So the VA uh, tends to be lower. And can you explain why? I anyone on the panel why that is? So uh, well, in part because the VA gets some automatic statutory rebates uh, mm -hmm. based on the drugs that it buys. Um, but also because the VA uh, negotiates on behalf of all of the members of the VA and is able to use its marketing power to try to, to, try to uh, negotiate that. But all, and also because it takes a very thoughtful approach to uh, developing its formulary and, and can uh, use inclusion on its formulary as another way of trying to negotiate a fair price for the product. So you would, so you would say, and, and am I correct in saying that uh, the VA is using collective bargaining power in the market to lower the price of drugs as a counter to uh, some of the for-profit or, or profit motive um, pressures, upward pressures on the cost of pharmaceuticals? Right. Okay, yes. Great. And I guess one last question in my remaining time. If you all could ask us you know, to act as members of Congress and do one thing, one action, what would that action be? So I think, for me, it's external reference prices. And that's something that President Trump has proposed in Medicare Part uh, B, to pay 126% of what the, um, the, the, the other, other countries do. I'm not sure I would agree with the countries that he chose, but essentially to pay 123%. If right now, in the, in the uh, Medicare Part D, which is most of the money, we pay about three to four times what other countries pay for the same drugs. I don't think we can bring it down to what they pay or 126% of it, but we could bring it down a lot. 
I, I tend to think uh, external reference pricing is not a good idea, and I think that what we should do is actually get our own house in order and negotiate and, and, and try to evaluate the value and, and comparative and cost effectiveness of drugs better in the U.S. and try to determine what the right price is for U.S. patients rather than relying on what the prices are in other countries. But if so, if I could say one thing that we could do, I think it would be to, uh, again, try to develop a system where, where the government could I try to identify what the fair price is for a drug uh, and what are reasonable prices for the drug based on the value that the drug provides to patients, and then use that to, to uh, negotiate with the pharmaceutical manufacturer to try to get a more effective price that we, we provide. We in AARP would like uh, you to have HHS be allowed to negotiate lower drug prices on behalf of Medicare beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you Thank all you so very much. much. Thank Mr. you, Chair, Ms. You Presley. You've got some. I also think that what people are starting to see, at least in, in the occupation uh, of, of Palestine, is um, just an increasing crisis of humanitarian condition. You use the term the occupation of Palestine. Um, I think it, what I meant is like the, the settlements, places where, um, where Palestinians are experiencing uh, Difficulty. Do you think you can expand on that? I am not the expert on geopolitics on this issue. Well, that is clear. Here to react, Michael Knowles, host of the Michael Knowles Show. Michael, good to have you with us. Abby, good to be here. All right, you listen to the DNC, and that is the future of their party. <laughs> That is the future of their party. I think she's a good representative. The Democrats at this point are proudly ignorant and thoroughly anti-Israel, so it makes sense. This poor girl, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, is not making a great first impression, and that is the lasting one. What do we know about her since her campaign hit the national stage? She is a liar. She lied about her upbringing. She pretended to be... Uh, from a poor part of the Bronx and grow up there. In reality, she grew up in a ritzy part of one of the ritziest counties in the country. I know this because I grew up in the town over from her. So we know that, and now we know that she is proudly ignorant. She has this great line, she says, uh, I, you know, I don't really know a lot about this, but I firmly believe, you know, frequently wrong, but never in doubt. She, mm -hmm. she uses the slogans that we've seen from Democrats now for the past 20 years. You know, we heard in the Bush era, Bush lied, people died. He didn't. We heard no, more, no war for oil. There wasn't one. Now we hear Trump colluded with Russia. There's no evidence of that. And the uh, myth of Israeli occupied Palestine, which I believe is the country east of Narnia and west of Wakanda, is another example of that. You know, Margaret Hoover in that television program scratched mm. just below the surface and Ocasio-Cortez had no answer. She didn't know anything. All she had learned was ideology. I think apparently Yorktown High School is not as good as we all thought it was. So by She's the way, just Michael, learned these to your point, she went to Boston University. She says she doesn't know geopolitics in that interview. She majored in international relations. So obviously this is <laughs> something that she claims to know a lot about. Kudos to Margaret Hoover in that interview for simply listening and following up with, can you please expand on this? What Not only am I eager to discuss the issues with you, I'm willing to offer $10,000 to your campaign today. Wow. All right. First the challenge, and then the rejection. Conservative commentator Ben Shapiro calling for a debate with Democratic Socialist Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. He wants to debate her. He wants to debate her on the issues. The New York congressional candidate take an issue with Ben Shapiro, tweeting out, just like catcalling, I don't owe a response to unsolicited requests from men with bad intentions. And also like catcalling, for some reason, they feel entitled to one. Whoa, all right. We called uh, Ocasio-Cortez and we asked her to come on the show. She has yet to respond, but you know who did respond? None other than Ben Shapiro for his first interview since that tweet. Ben, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Making first of all, I, I just want to know. She, quick, quick. She's making news with you here. Say, go ahead, yeah, say. Uh, go, quick, quick comment. First of all, how dare you catcall Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez by inviting her on your show? <laughs> I mean, how dare you? That's sexism in action right there. <laughs> yeah, apparently. You know, what do you think of that, though? I mean, to use that term, which, um, you know, that's just to, to remind everyone, a woman's walking down the street and someone, you know, whistles or something, that's catcalling. Uh, how is what you did, asking her to have an intellectual debate on the actual issues, how is that in any way relevant or similar uh, to a catcall? 
Uh, cat calling must be very weird in Queens. I don't know if they're like construction <laughs> workers standing on street corners and shouting to women, hey, baby, want to have an hour-long public conversation about trade policy and the vagaries of Viennese economics versus neo-Marxist economics? It, it, gets, it gets strange in her district, apparently. But again, this is, this is so many folks on the left jumping to a sort of intersectional defense in which anybody who requests a discussion or a debate must be evil by their very nature, right? I'm a man, therefore I am catcalling her, even though as an Orthodox Jew, I have never catcalled a woman in my entire life. Uh, it, it's catcalling because I guess if I suggest that I want to have a conversation, I'm demanding a response. Well, every request is a request. All she had to say here was, nah, that would have been fine. I mean, she's got that prerogative, but she, she, she goes around talking about though? how... I mean, that's part of our platform, Absolutely. right? Everybody's a victim, and, and, you know, we need to take as much money as we can from everybody else to redistribute it. That's what socialism is about. So is she just playing that victim card? No question. And, and the fact that she feels the necessity to go to this particular card, right, to, to, to play the I'm a, I'm a female and therefore I'm being victimized, this is like cat calling. The fact she goes there, instead of just saying, you know what, I'm not interested in debate, the reason she didn't say the latter is because she didn't want to look like she was afraid. Uh, and she's been going around on, on the Internet, suggesting that people like Ali Stuckey are afraid of her when they make satire about her or that people on the right are deeply afraid of her perspective. And then the minute that somebody says, you know what, I, I'm willing to have a discussion or a debate with you. And not only that, just to make it worth your time, I'll give money to charity or your campaign. Yeah. Then it's all of a sudden catcalling if you, if you suggest such a thing. It's pretty amazing. Yeah,